This is Delhi. Please stand by for our next program. This is All India Radio. In the national program of talks tonight, we bring you a discussion entitled Tales of Gyamo and Sultan. The participants are Mike Pandey, renowned wildlife filmmaker and conservationist, Doel Trivedi, wildlife film director and scriptwriter, Gautam Pandey, wildlife film producer and director, and G. Rajaraman, media personality, who initiates and moderates the discussion. Tales of Gyamo and Sultan. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Mike Pandey, award-winning filmmaker, somebody who loves the environment, somebody who makes nature simple for us to understand. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for taking the time out. His son, Gautam, who has uh, been a second generation, the difficult challenge that you have taken on, Gautam. To be a second generation, anything is a challenge and to be following his footsteps and to be supporting what Mike does is incredible. And Duel, third member of the family here, who's now a filmmaker herself and uh, who writes scripts and uh, wins awards. Right now, they are in the studio because they have done a fascinating film on a snow leopard called uh, Gyamo. Mike, Duel or Gautam, the three of you, you can choose who wants to answer this question first. Tell us a little bit more about Gyamo and the search for Gyamo. Well, uh, the search for Gyamo started uh, two years before it was actually released on leading global wildlife TV channels. It was a chance encounter. We were filming something else in Ladakh and we heard of a snow leopard visiting this village where we were filming near. And the conflict between, and we were surprised with how close the snow leopards come to the village and the people. And we all thought this is incredible. This is a story that needs to be told. And Gotham and Mike and all of us, we were invested in it for two years, going back, spending in our own money, trying to figure out how we can film this and follow this leopard. And it uh, took us, I think, a year and a half of just research and figuring out where the leopard is coming to, where we can film it, where should we place the camera traps and all of that and what the real story is. After that, we had this story and we had filmed for two years and then we put the story together for release in 2017. Beautiful love. Uh... Mike, you've been with animals nearly all your life, uh, spent a lot of time observing them and caring for them. How special is Gyamo to you? I think every animal is special, but uh, this was not only special because the snow leopard is critically endangered and very little is known about it. It's an enigmatic creature and to chance upon it in this remote village was very, very lucky because in thousands of square kilometers, there are hardly 150 to 200 snow leopards. And one of the things is finding them, locating them. And I thought this was a signal from nature to say, hey, this animal needs support. It needs to be saved, to be conserved. And people, you can conserve something only if you know about it. It's value to local people, local communities, the environment. And only when you understand that you respect and what you respect, you naturally protect. And I think given the harsh climatic conditions, the altitudes, 18,000 feet and above, it was one of the toughest films we ever tackled and we had to stay there. And at high altitude, one of the problems is that apart from air, you get constant headache and uh, you get hallucinations. You can't sleep at all. But I think the crew persevered and I think I must say there were a lot of times when I said, OK, we've done two shots of this one, enough. But Gotham used to trudge on and used to push four or five times at uh, that level. There was a tremendous respect I developed for the crew and for all those, including uh, Doyle. And, and also, just to add, the wildlife department that works there, because uh, like you said, it's thousands of kilometers. The department itself is small. Terrain is extremely tough, and they need to protect this terrain. So we work very closely with the wildlife department as well to you know, get access to some of these areas, and information is very hard to come by. And I think it's only when there's a partnership of all the stakeholders, then you can bring about an effective conservation movement and I think the system there, the ecosystem, which is very fragile, needs the snow leopard to survive. And if it's intact, then it can ensure stability in the region. They're very, very poor people. They're some of the rarest plants in the world growing up there, medicinal plants, which the world needs. We are still in an infantile position. The mankind is just growing. We are such a young species. So what's important is to understand let's conserve, let's have an intact ecosystem. And therefore, reason alone, if you go that inch forward, risk a little more so that people can see and respect and begin to come to terms that, look, we have to leave this area intact, then changes take place. 
And the question usually people ask, Why are you risking your life and you are know, going there? Why are you 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 going there? The satisfaction is of knowing what you've done is like a little lamp, is bringing light into darkness, empowering people, building capacities, making them understand the enigmatic forces and also the magic that keeps this world together in this fragile web of life. So that I think it was a very satisfying, tough, rugged. <laughs> Many times I question myself, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, would you want to answer that question, Gautam? Um, <laughs> he just spoke about how there's not much money for wildlife filmmakers. Did you at any point of time turn up and ask your father, Mike, what are we doing? Why are we not earning a little bit more? Maybe we could film commercials <laughs> and make a little bit more money. Was there any time where you got into a conflict with that at some point of time? <laughs> well, no conflict, uh, but he did begin in uh, the Hindi film industry and Razia Sultan and all those. So I sort of, I was like a bit like Ira over here is watching us in this room. I was on the Razia Sultan set and Betab, I think, was the other film. Just watching this world, which is very interesting and intriguing. And somewhere I think he changed direction and I sort of went with the flow. Maybe I did question it as a teenager and wondered why we don't go to this, uh, you know, these shiny, glittery sets with shiny, glittery people. And I think once you start doing the work and you're seeing impact, that, I think, starts answering some questions by itself. So one of the films while I was growing up was Shaws of Silence on Whale Sharks which was uh, filmed in Gujarat. So that was a turning point for me in my life to see the impact a film could make and how my father seemed to do it only with a very small crew, only very few people who believed that whale sharks actually came to India. And he persevered, went on, made the film, then, as he said, with help, support from other individuals who believed in it. Protection then was triggered and it, and it came in and now there's a law. So I think the satisfaction of having made an impact is very hard to weigh against something which is like awesome. fame or money or anything like that. Awesome. I think, uh, yeah, you see, the, uh, the whale shark is the largest fish in the world and it was critically endangered and nobody in the world believed that it exists. So for the Indian film to protect a species on a global scale, I think that is the satisfaction that you have done. You are not a burden on the planet Earth. You've contributed. You've done what you must do as a human being, reached out. And I think that's what drives us, this passion that if there's something in distress, reach out, protect, help. They were not created for mankind to come and decimate and kill. So every single one of us has a responsibility to ensure that life on the planet runs in a balanced way. There's an equilibrium. We cannot fracture it. Right now we are living on a broken world and we need to protect it. And filmmakers are needed for that, to carry this information into the remotest area in India. And that's why Doyle, when she writes, she's always got the grassroots in her mind. Doyle, I want to ask you this question. Gautam Mia just spoke about having watched glitzy sets in Bollywood. Mike spoke about the ocean, uh, the Arabian Sea. You have seen different sets, so to say, uh, not just Gyamo, but even otherwise uh, tracking wildlife in the country and beyond. Can you just describe some of these so-called sets that God has made, that nature has made, and tell us where is it that Mike Gautam and you go and get some of the best visuals. <laughs> That's a big question for me. Making wildlife films gives us the opportunity to visit some of the most biodiverse places in India and out of India as well. But our focus is on the hotspots in India. And our films, we filmed in high altitude regions in Himalayas. We filmed in Western Ghats. We filmed on the coastline. And it is just incredible, the biodiversity that we've seen. And of course, it's a very difficult time for the planet because we see less and less each time we visit. And for example, Gyamo we shot in Ladakh. And uh, even while we were filming, we saw changes like the most shocking thing that we saw in Ladakh was this garbage patch that uh, in the film we have highlighted. Because when we think of Ladakh, we think of beautiful mountains, we think of endless patches of snow. But we never ever think of all the people who visit there and all the garbage they create and where it goes. And which is very interesting because when people watch the film, that's one of the things that really hits people hard is, yes, the snow leopard, yes, this beautiful place, but all this garbage and how am I responsible for it? So that's one of the things our endeavor is always to go to a place wherever we are, whether it's the Western Ghats or the Himalayas, is what's the real story beyond the beauty and the landscapes that you see right in front of you. Kutum, you want to talk a little bit about the scars that uh, mankind leaves in these places? 
Duel just spoke about the garbage, tons of garbage that uh, you found in Ladakh. Even when I'm in a hide, sometimes waiting for, you know, some animal to appear, we were in Great Himalayan National Park, and you know, you try and make yourself as small as possible with no sound, with no impact, you even breathe less. I feel sitting in a hide, but even after two, three days, after we took the hide down, there was a bare patch there. Just by existing in that space, I felt and animals, I think, don't really do that unless you know they're making dens and homes like that for themselves and then more permanent damage is done to places where we decide to alter the environment like dams homes tunnels and of course landfills which is the ultimate jugaad because we don't know what to do with it let's just keep it in one place and then we'll figure out what to do and ideas have always been they sound good but execution is where we seem to fail each and every time like there has to be a ban of single use plastic in the himalayan region there is no discussion you know like other hard decisions are being taken in the country these days they need to be equally firm decisions taken regarding environment and forest policy people are coming up with solutions trying to do their own bit by making brick bottles i saw in ladakh but that is just you know like a feel good fix temporary fix because uh, the bottle will still exist even if it's in a brick and a brick would mean now we're building more houses there and i think the most apparent footprint we see of ourselves when we are filming is the diminished line of forests wherever we go line between habitation and the forests are just decreasing decreasing and it's now visible to you just like that you can walk to ranthambore or any forest area in the nilgiris and you see how close people live to forests and or roads or railway or lines roads railway lines and i think that is one of the biggest concerns for our country and and other countries in the world but our country especially because the pressures of our population are so high that we don't even realize how much impact we have on forests so this is actually a very very big issue in the country right mike now. i know it's a difficult question to answer in a jiffy but is there a solution to what uh, doel just pointed out us asking for more from the forest and putting more pressure on the people who live on the fringes i think we are the only species that has the ability to process information and bring about change the poorest unfortunately in this country the local communities that live around forests are the worst to suffer we sitting in cities can pass on judgments and make statements and have seminars but it has no impact there's an urgent need to reinvent the world our lifestyles need to change and as doyle said we have population pressure there are too many people so we have to work harder we have to be minimal everybody's waking up to the plastic now you have to take a firm step and say no plastic means no plastic wherever we go i mean in films division or the international film festival where i have been president of the steering committee we asked no plastic less of bottles and happening places wherever i have a little talks in universities in chandigarh university and things at science festivals vigyan prasar people have stopped using plastic bottles it's not difficult lifestyles need to change habits need to change so there is need to educate people inform them once again to wake up before it's too late and that's what our films are i've been doing a program on doordarshan called earth matters it's a capacity building interactive program which reaches out to the remotest areas and gotham was surprised at 16 or 17000 feet four five houses there they looked at us closely said aap to earth matters ho hum aapka program dekhte hain kabhi band nahi karna there is hunger for this people need to be informed the trouble is there is a paucity so we have to have as i said reinvent the system educational environmental education is crucial conservation of natural resources like water forests are crucial they should be top agenda top priority every single person every single young man listening to what i'm saying is like a spark is like a dynamite all he needs is ignite it and he can transform the whole world the future the government of india has shown an inclination towards conservation towards improving the environment it has shown an attitude what has your own research shown you i think there is uh, incredible work happening on the ground level scientists researchers they are doing small scale businesses that are trying to create an impact that goes against everything that we've spoken about right now michael let me take you back to gabo tell us a little bit about what kind of support you got from the local people when you shot this film on gamo tell me a little bit about gamo itself what was it like to even capture one frame of gamo coming in for the kill that was laid down there 
I think uh, we need to thank, we need to acknowledge the Environment Ministry who was very supportive and the local officers in Ladakh, friends like Stenzin, David, who all pulled in local communities, villages, who came in and informed us what was happening. And uh, that made it possible for us to film. And then we had brave hearts who were trudging day and night. The story of Gyamo is the story of a female with two cubs who suddenly one day spots a male intruding into her area and she knows her cubs are in danger. They'll be killed in the next 48 hours. And there and then she decides to take her two cubs and move out beyond the 18,000 uh, feet on the other side of the mountains. And the story is totally in search of those cubs, what happened to them. Did you find them? Did you find and the cubs? Find, and that was left to Doyle and Gotham <laughs> and his team. Finally, towards the end, and I must salute these guys for their perseverance, for the commitment and dedication. I would have given, frankly, a long time ago. I said, okay, nature must take part. But they followed the mother till the end, kept looking for her till the last frame you see in the last two, three minutes. The mother appearing suddenly. And then cub number one. And then cub number two. And the poor camera battery sniffed out that there. We found them. And it's a happy story of how a mother... You see, nature is trying. Nature is trying its best. But the question is, is mankind willing to give nature a chance to bounce back? A mother takes it away in conditions where they're... I mean, hostile conditions. A terrain where finding prey is so difficult. And the kids survived. And the babies survived. So here's a tigress with two cubs. Are we going to poison it? Or are we going to inform the people that look, it needs food. Do not hunt down the deer. That's natural food for the snow leopard. It needs to exist. And then the deer there need to eat up uh, the little grass to ensure that they keep on growing. So I think it is not only about progress. It's about a balance. We all need the environment to survive. And it's about whichever terrain, whether it's a high altitude pine forest or whether it's the Western Ghat forests or, or a, a tropical jungle or the desert. There's a need for a different type of education. It's not about bucks. All the money in the world cannot create a drop of water. It's precious. And believe me, there's only 0.4 to 0.6% of fresh water that's available to the whole planet. And we have to conserve it. And it's running out. I think with Guillermo came many lessons for us. Survival and then ensuring harmony, how to live in harmony. And we've seen the leopard does not kill human beings. But today the situation is this, what Toil was saying earlier. The rubbish dump is one of the greatest cancers for the snow leopard today. The rubbish dump ensures more dogs gravitate towards that. Consumerism ensures that every day a few thousand chickens are thrown away because they run out of date. So the dogs live on the rubbish dumps. So they have become feral dogs. There are five to six thousand of them. Now they are moving out and hunting snow leopards or bears mating with wolves. That's a disruption which is all going to affect the snow leopard. I believe Ladakh is the realm of the snow leopard and the snow leopard is healthy and intact. Other species will fall in place. That's why it's very important to save the snow leopard. Not just because it's an exotic animal. And also it's about every person who goes to see a snow leopard, he carries a responsibility. He's get entering into a very fragile, eco-sensitive zone and he has to ensure that he does not create a rupture or disturb the atmosphere. Come back with your make minimum sound. Indians are basically very noisy. If they spot a snow leopard, you hear Allah gula, are, 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 are. No, calm down. Watch in silence. It's like meditation. See, do your job and come back. There's enough. But we need to learn to live in harmony. The snow leopard can stay intact, provided we give it a chance. Mysterious areas and how snow leopard behaves, Gotham will tell you. Night encounters, worrying encounters when you go away in inky darkness. You don't know how to come down the hill. There's no light. And snow leopards and wolves are moving around. One day he did a very foolish thing. He heard, uh, I must tell you this. <laughs> there are moments like this. That's when I said, okay. You okay to hear this again? <laughs> as long as it has to do with the film. <laughs> uh, one one day uh, we were sitting in Delhi and uh, our man, Norbu rang up said, Gautam sahab, jaldi aajao. Uh, kill ho gaya. We have been waiting for two, three months and uh, suddenly a kill. And he takes a plane 
and his camera and all shoots off to Ladakh. The mandatory two days in Leh are forgotten. He drives straight to Ule and beyond and then Kidare. No rest still. High altitude. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. They go and spot the place. So the rule is that, you know, you always have, like a, in diving, you always carry a buddy. So Gautam sends this local person. Aap ghar jao, aap ki need kharab hogi. And in minus 40, he sits in this tent, waiting for the wolves and the snow leopard to come. And then he hears the growling of the snow leopard and all that, and maybe the growling of the wolves also. They're nearby. He peeps out, comes back, and he kuch nazar nahi aya. And as he's sitting, then he realizes the that he heard was his stomach crumbling. Lungs. <laughs> his lungs, his lungs going gurgling because of the intense uh, temperature, minus 40. All the air he was breathing was turning into a mucus and his lungs were totally choked. So he threw out maybe a cup full of uh, sputum and a mess. And the wife, and he <laughs> stuck there and the wife had warned him. He said, you let my husband stay with you because the loneliest time is from 2.30 to 4 a.m. When all alone, silence. Well, that's probably the best time to and, uh, spot and yeah, shoot as well. Perhaps. And I must say, I was very envious of him having experienced such extreme conditions and come out and still grinning, you see. The snow leopard wouldn't have attacked him. He's too much of a gentleman. But the wolves are ferocious. They uh, hunt in packs. But uh, I think this, this is the spirit of the adventure that carries through. So I didn't tell him, don't do it next time. That's the part I of did. life. So that's Gyamo. Uh, Gautam, mm. would you like to take uh, the listener through the Sultan experience? Because uh, for us lesser mortals, if I can use that <laughs> term, um, the tiger is more easily accessible and you've done some splendid work around the tiger as well. Uh, would you like to share some experience from shooting Sultan and mm. from filming and making it uh, known to the world? Sure. Well, Sultan was actually we started filming in Ranthambore for an entirely different project. And, uh, you know, there are days where you, you get sightings every day and you try and follow this one tiger or tigress and looking for a good story or angle. And while we were there, there was a lean period of four or five days and then uh, there was a guy there. He said, why don't you go and try and look for this young tiger that's been born over there on the other side of the forest in Sultan Chokki. I said, yeah, what's the tigress? He's like, her name is Noor and she has a cub. And he's just been named Sultan because he's born in Sultan Chokki. So I went, the first day I went, did not see him. Second day, again, no sighting. On the third day, he was just sitting. And from behind a bush came out this young cub. And that was Sultan. And he was the, the only cub that this tigress had. And because he was the only cub, he had like, like an only child, was a bit spoiled. Had full on 100% attention of the mother. Was, and she was a ace hunter so she was killing often and he was growing at a fast rate and everyone thought he's going to be the next big tiger of Ranthambore you know that's the always the conversation who's going to be the dominant male in Ranthambore and take over the lake area which is like the prime real estate of Ranthambore National Park so uh, he was growing up fine and we decided okay we're going to stick with him and we're going to keep filming him and see what's going to happen next and he's always up to all kinds of things he had a fight with a bear he uh, was always challenging his father. And we would go every two weeks, film for, uh, you know, 10 days and then come back to Delhi and then go again. And in the middle of this, uh, the monsoon season started and monsoon, the parks close. And we did our last shoot in the monsoon to show the forest change. And then after that, Sultan disappeared. And we, so all this energy and time we spent a year and a half, he wasn't old enough yet to leave his mother. And yet he had. And then the stories and rumors started coming out that he's probably been poached. At that time, there was another tigress uh, called Sundari who had been poached uh, and her body was recovered. I think she had been poisoned that time. So, you know, that was the general uh, vibe in the air that, you know, the forest is under threat. There's no buffer, real buffer like that. There's some mining happening on one side. There's, uh, you know, they, they kill cattle sometimes. So it was assumed naturally that Sultan's been killed as well. So we kind of, you know, mourned his death and almost gave up. And then this sort of niggling thought came back and said, we should go back and try and complete the story. Even if he's gone, we should complete it. And that's the story then. So he went back and he started speaking to people and spoke to Dharam Kandal, who works in Ranthambore, uh, runs an NGO called Tiger Watch. 
another close friend of ours, uh, Aditya Dikhi Singh, he runs a resort and he's deeply involved with conservation work around there as well. And we tried to join these dots that had been left. That's where we heard of this amazing program called Village Volunteers, where the Forest Department and Tiger Watch have enrolled volunteers from the village, shepherds and goat herders, to be the eyes for the department. And they're on a payroll as well. And these are people and they train to camera trap and to uh, report through WhatsApp. So it was a great uh, mix of technology with being at the grassroot and empowering the locals as well. And we still didn't know if we'd find him, but we decided to, to film it and we'll see how it goes. And as the dots joined, we found a trail of a tiger and uh, village volunteers had followed a similar case earlier where a tiger had gone missing and they found him in Madhya Pradesh almost 200 kilometers away. With that hope, we went on this trail of a male tiger because you can make out from the pug marks if it's a female or a male. So it was a male. And we followed this trail and we finally found him 100 kilometers from Rantambor in a very disturbed habitat called Kela Devi. But uh, he found this patch where he could hunt. And a few months after that, a fee- he found a female tigress and they had cubs after that. So we found a happy ending, but it's not always like that. <laughs> yeah, once again, the tiger has found a safe haven, secure haven. Are we willing to give it a chance to survive? Does the answer come from uh, the numbers that have uh, recently emerged about how India has got more tigers now than uh, it did even five years ago? Not only that, you see, our technologies have improved. The way we look for tigers, apart from just pug marks and sightings, or camera traps. There's technology available now that you can see where you couldn't see earlier. So naturally there are a few more numbers and in some parks, like in Madhya Pradesh, Pench and all, the population has increased, which is uh, really great. And I think Environment Ministry is really clued on and is very uh, consciously making an effort to bring about change and, and relaxing and also making sure there are certain areas that are restricted so the tiger can breed. So I think what is needed is more area is required, especially fragmented forests need to be restored. I also feel that forests are shrinking. This must stop and uh, illegal mining and loss. You see, the paradox is, as I was saying earlier, in Canada and in Sweden, which exports wood, there are over 9,000 trees per person. In China, is 100 trees per person. In India, every person has 28 trees. We need more trees, we need more forests, we need to restore our ecosystem, especially the forest one. And that's where our water is coming from. That needs to be told to people. Let them take charge, let them take ownership. Rules alone, the government is making its efforts, but 80% of dirt and pollution in the Yamuna comes from our homes. So that's where it must stop. You spoke about the tree, how it is a very important element in, in where we are. Our 28 trees to an Indian, you say. Hopefully, we will find more trees of life. Uh, Mike Gautam and Doel, thank you so much for taking time, not only to be in the studio, but also for conveying the message to the world that we need to leave it in a better space than we found it in. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. In the national program of talks tonight, you were listening to a discussion entitled Tales of Gyamu and Sultan. The participants were Mike Pandey, renowned wildlife filmmaker and conservationist, Doel Trivedi, wildlife film director and scriptwriter, Gautam Pandey, wildlife film producer and director, and G. Rajaraman, media personality, who initiated and moderated the discussion. Produced by Naveen K. Gupta, this program was a contribution of AIR Delhi in our national program of talks and came to you from the Delhi station of All India Radio.